Okay, so uh, perhaps the, you know, the first problem in the whole field of, uh, if you wish, in economics, if you look at it in, some, in, a, in one way, is basically how do we allocate things? And the same thing is probably true of the first problem in computer science, how do we allocate things? Uh, from the economic point of view, or at least some economic point of view, an auction is the first way you can do it. You have one object, there are two people, let's say, who want this object, and you have to decide which one, the, which one of them gets the object. And, you know, one natural way to, to solve it is you, do, you have some kind of auction between these two people decide, to decide which one of them would get it. It becomes really an auction once you have, a, rather than, an, a, let's say, a computer science allocation problem, once you take into, into consideration the distributed nature of the problem, that the two different people not only have different information, but they only have different wants. Each one of them wants something else. I want me to get the object, you want you to get the object, and that's not the same, not for me at least. So uh, an auction is really the first kind of problem you ask, what kind of allocation do we do of a single unit item? And then, of course, once we look at, into more complex scenarios, we have a bunch of items that we need to allocate, we start having need to have auctions of multiple items. It can be the same, not the same, constraints. Then you can start with uh, lots of different questions. And uh, all of the auction theory, uh, the starting point of this auction theory is a question, okay, how do we, you know, what are our criteria according to which we want to allocate the item? How do we model the, you know, the input, if you wish, what the different people want? And the starting point of most of auction theory is what is go called is evaluation. So what is evaluation? We assume this is like the simplest scenario and the starting point really. You have some kind of value. You like this item at seven. This other guy likes the item at eight. And the question is now, if we want to know which one should get it, eight seems more than better than seven. Okay? So the starting point is evaluation. How much does each participant value each possible outcome? If we have lots of units to allocate for each possible allocation, say, or for each possible joint decision, that we need to come to, how much do they value it expressed in some number, some common currency. And the idea of this common currency is that this is something that we can basically add or subtract money from. So when I try to say, what do I want, my utility, what I want, what I aim to optimize, being a rational participant here, is basically the value that I get from the common decision, from the output, minus whatever payments that I have. And this is the normal way that uh, you, know, you start modeling in auction theory. Now, uh, as opposed to what uh, you know, at least I thought of the computer scientists starting to look at economics at the beginning, economists do not like the idea of money, at least not in their models. They're perfectly happy with it in <laughs> other places. So it's, the problem with money is that it's not really well defined. I mean, it's not clear that there is some kind of common currency that you can compare my utility with your utility. It's completely reasonable to say, what do I prefer, option A or option B? It's also reasonable to say, ask you the same question, do you prefer option A or option B? But it's very difficult to quantify these, these two things and say, oh, I prefer option A to B more than you prefer option A to B. Okay, that's, that's problematic and economists really do not like it. And it's not a choice usually used in most of the rest of economics. Usually, in most of economic theory, they actually prefer working abstractly in terms of my preference relation and your preference relation, and this is considered an assumption, what's called sometimes a quasi-linear assumption, and the quasi-linear is because the money is linear with the rest of the uh, utility, with the rest of the valuation. And now, in this situation, the reason that we're limiting ourselves, basically, to working in this quasi-linear model, assuming that there is money, is really because of a very strong impossibility result the gibber sutherswit result, which basically say, says that if you want to work in a general model, where we can't move money from one person to another or to the auctioneer, then basically you can't do almost anything that you want in, in the proper way, taking, taking your rationality into account. And this is a very strong impossibility result. Basically, it's equivalent, it's very similar, not equivalent, very similar to Arrow's theorem, showing that you cannot do any kind of a proper social choice under certain assumptions. But here, it just really just shows that you cannot do anything once you're outside of this uh, quasi-linear model. And that's why auction theorists are happy uh, working with money. Now, I have to admit that from my point of view at the beginning, I thought that this was a sort of a... I didn't understand the obsession of the economists of getting rid of money. 
I thought that's a tiny little, tiny little function and it was a help. And I have to admit that the more I'm working on this, I see that really money is a real limitation. It really breaks your, you know, many problems that you're interested in, you cannot actually take into account. And I will t talk about this in this talk. I will talk about one very, very simple constraint that you see all the time in real life that simply does not fall into the quasi-linear model. You cannot just express it with money that everything is simply linear in the money. So money will be in it, but it's not that you can always just add the money to the value that you get from the rest. And uh, before I want to get into it, uh, actually this is a problem that actually started by some real problem. And I thought to tell you about the, little, the real problem. Not that the solution would have anything to talk about the original problem. <laughs> it would be a nice little theory. Uh, but at least I thought that the motivation uh, would be uh, I should talk about. And of course, I work now in Google, which, as you know, is an advertising company. And basically, uh, what they do is they sell ads. So they can sell ads, uh, what's called AdWords. So these are little ads here, little text ads next to your search results. They also sell what's called display ads, the big ads, which can be on any web page, and you can have the you know, various things there, like pictures. And by the way, actually, Google also sells TV ads, and actually now it's just this announced that it will stop selling radio ads. Uh, but it sells all kinds of ads. Okay? So what do I mean it sells all kinds of ads? That's very important. So from the point of view of the, of the advertising world, basically, what you sell is this area, and this area, and this area, and this area, and these 30 seconds on the TV at this time and this station. That's what you sell. Everything else is sort of just a ploy to get people to watch your ad. So, uh, uh, the way that people work with Google and the AdWords, basically, advertiser, Google actually does an, uh, an auction for every little ad spot that it has. So to know which guy gets his ad to show here or there, basically there's a little auction done every time someone out there is actually looking at the ad. And when, if you're an advertiser and you want to say, I want my ad to appear there, this is basically what you need to specify. So you first need to specify where, of course, first you have to give, this is my ad, okay? It's text or a picture or a video clip if it's a TV ad. Then you have to say where you want your ad to appear. So it can be on web pages and a certain TV show in time, uh, or you can, of course, see, there can be uh, lots of complication how convenient it is to express where you want your ad to appear. Okay? But at the end, I want it to be here, 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 there. These are all the places that I'm interested in. Then you have to say, how much are you bidding for it? How much am I willing to pay for my ad to appear there? And again, the way that uh, you count uh, how you can specify how much you're willing to pay, you can specify it either per ad, or per thousand viewers, or per clicks, or per action, or in various other ways. At the end, it's just, I'm willing to pay X if my ad actually wins and takes, gets that play. The third thing that you need to specify is a total budget. So this auction is actually runs on every single time there is some, someone watching a certain web page, there is some kind of unit that's being ad slot, ad slot that's being sold. Uh, you will win some of them, you will lose some of them. At the end, there's also your budget. What is the total amount that you're willing to pay for all of your wins in a certain day or week or period or whatever? <clears throat> so, and this is your input. And once you enter this input, which can be simple or complicated, because each one of these can be specified in various, uh, you know, convenient, less convenient or more convenient ways, then simply, Google runs the sequence of options each time it comes by with wind and sun. And the question is, how are we looking at these things? What's happening there? So if you look at the target and the bid, that's very easy to understand what's going on. That directly corresponds to the valuation in theoretical terms. You're saying, how much do I value if I get this item? That's a number. You know, this is worth $7 to me if I get this spot or that spot. And by the way, in this context, it's very simple. If I get a collection of spots, it's just a sum of values. That's what I'm interested in. But the problem is what happens in the budget. The budget is not something that you can uh, simply push into the valuation. It doesn't say how much something is worth for you, but rather how much you're willing to pay for it, which is something completely different. Okay? So if I'm saying my budget is $1,000, 
it does not mean that if as many spots as you give me, it's only worth $1,000 to me. No, I'm still happy to get more and more, and I may prefer the, this spot over that spot, and so on, but I simply cannot pay more than $1,000. So the budget simply does not fall into the quasi-linear model. It's not some linear on some, uh, some, something about your valuation, but rather about how much you pay. Now, what is, so actually, it's, a, it's, a, it's quite of a mystery. What the hell are these budgets, if you want to look at it? So that's, of course, a very obvious from any business point of view, and that's the first thing. And what are these, do these budgets mean? Why do people, why do advertisers use any that kind of budgets? So if you try, so I mean, there's no real, uh, real good answer to that. But if you start looking into it, so the first, uh, the first kind of distinction that people make is between there are basically two kinds of advertisers. The real truth is, of course, everyone is somewhere in the middle of the, of the spectrum. But the direct response advertisers are the ones that basically t want you to do something ni now and buy something now. So if you see this kind of ad, they really want you to click and buy gold now on the internet. Now, these advertisers, they are basically usually quite quasi-linear because they know exactly how much money they'll make from you. They know from people who come to their website, 2% actually make a buy, and on those that make a buy, at the average, they make $30 net revenue. And so they know exactly how much they're willing to pay for an average customer to come to their website. And they will basically bid their value up to that level and no more than that. And from their point of view, this is basically like a money pump. The more people they get to their site, the better it is, and their budget should be basically infinite. And for all practical purposes, it is, it is infinite. Because usually whatever the limits they have on their business, I don't know, the total amount of gold that they can buy or something like that, is much larger than what they can actually sell. So these guys really do not care about the budgets. But then there are other, and by the way, okay, but then there are other kinds of advertisers. Basically, in, gen in general, want to give you some kind of, you know, fuzzy feeling, you know, Coke is good, it will make you young and happy and lovable and loving. And they're not making immediate money out of it, but somehow it's changing your brain and you'll keep buying Coke for the rest of your life. And, and these guys, they cannot measure. So you, you would think that even these guys would know how to value, you know, how much is it worth for me, Coca-Cola, that you watch my ad, but they don't. They simply do not, they have no, no idea. But what they do have an idea, and this is a fact of life, they know what their budget is. They now have $5,000 per day to advertise on the internet, or on this kind of TV radio station. And why is it $5,000? What does it really represent? It's less than clear. It's probably something about the way they're managed, rather than anything real in some economic terms, but it's not completely clear. But what cannot be denied is that the reality of the life of these advertising for Google, for example, and, and many other scenarios, that the budgets are extremely real. These kinds of Coca-Cola companies have no idea what their valuation should be. That seems like a totally abstract, meaningless thing for them. But they know what their budget is, and we have to take this into account. <clears throat> okay, so what, they previously, what was happening previously about budgets in the world of auction? So first of all, one thing that should, uh, I should say explicitly, that auctions are actually an exception within, of the, within economics, but in the rest of economics, for example, in the markets and the Bro model and so on, budgets are an integral part from day one into in the model. Okay? So, but only in auction theory that is not the case. And the reason is because it doesn't really work so well, things are more difficult. So there are a few uh, works in economics for economists Basically, uh, they're trying to, they look at the standard kind of auctions, first price, press, second price, and see what happens when there are budgets there. You know, do you get more revenue, less revenue, comparing them, things like that. Uh, lately, there have been a bunch of works from the, coming from computer scientists working on auctions, and not surprisingly, we're talking about people from Microsoft, Google, and Yahoo, uh, <clears throat> that basically actually ask exactly this question. I have a bunch of items to sell. I have, there is a value for each item and a total budget. How do I allocate it correctly? So the guys from uh, Microsoft, uh, Borg Vital, uh, they designed auctions with good revenue properties using some kind of a randomized, uh, you know, randomized uh, auction. Uh, Feldman et al., uh, that's a group from Google, actually defined, def designed AdWords auctions uh, with some complications, but uh, with a certain non-standard model. And there's work by Zoe Abrams that actually uh, 
considered the, what kind of revenues do you get in the setting. So, uh, you know, there, are, there is some work here. And of course there are the even more guys actually looking, talking with computational issues, with purely computational issues. The works that I have uh, described here are the ones that actually take what's called incentives into account, or they really look at this as an auction problem, and not just a kind of combinatorial optimization problem, which there are still other problems, especially if you want some kind of online models. Okay. So now let me, that was like, uh, you know, this is where we came from. So now what is our model and what are we doing? So the model is very simple, what's called a multi-unit auction. Uh, basically, there are n units for sale, and they're identical to each other. Each bidder has a value v for each unit. Okay? And also, each bidder has a budget v for everything that he can uh, spend altogether. So now the utility of, a, of, a, of, a, of an advertiser, so the utility being what he aims to optimize, when he acts, he will act in a way that optimizes this, is very simple. If what he pays is at most his budget, then we'll simply in the usual quadrilinear setting. Then it's the amount that he makes, so we got x units. Each one of them is worth v, so his value he gets is x times v from the units that he got, minus the payments that he gets, that he pays. However, he cannot pay, in any case, more than his budget. Okay, so this is a restriction. This is where the quasi-linearity breaks. It's exactly this point. Okay. And we'll also talk, so we'll try to work together with the, the finite model, where you have a finite number of elements n, for example, 3, and the limit case, where you have an enormous amount of items, which will just treat m as 1, but infinitely indivisible. So this is like having some kind of continuum of the items. But basically, the large M basically does converge to this case. Okay, and of course, the interesting case is where the budget take, it, it comes, into, it, it comes into play. Okay, so for example, that you cannot win everything, because if you won everything, then you would be over budget. <coughs> okay, so... So one question is, the first question is, so usually in auctions, it's pretty clear, at least intuitively, what kind of things we want to, uh, we want to optimize. So uh, there are usually two possibilities. One of them, okay, I want to optimize my revenue as an auctioneer. Okay. And the other, this is like the question that the guy from Microsoft asked in the previous one. And the other question is, I want to optimize social welfare, what's called. I want to optimize, just get the, uh, the allocation that's optimal for everyone. And this is a question that I'm interested in now. <clears throat> okay. But the point is, it's not completely clear even this. So suppose I don't care about my own revenue at all. I just want to find the allocation that's best for everyone together. What does it mean in this situation? You can't just give all items to the guy, to the bidder with highest V, with highest value, because that ignores the budgets completely. So what does it exactly even mean to allocate it in most of the most efficient way? Okay. It's not clear. So, uh, and the, with the lack of clarity, there is one thing that obviously we need to do, and this is what's called getting a Pareto efficient allocation. So while it's not clear what is the best solution, okay, it's clear what is definitely a bad solution. Okay? So, uh, a bad solution is a solution where, which you can completely improve it. So let's look at an allocation xi pi. So each bidder i gets xi units of the item and pays pi dollars. Okay? And let's see what would a completely better allocation from that be. So a different allocation with prime is strictly better than our allocation if it's better for everyone. So first of all, every i, every bidder is happier with a prime allocation than with a non-prime allocation. Second of all, the auctioneer itself, the total number, that, the amount that they pay, is more in the prime allocation than the non-prime allocation. And one of these equalities is actually strict. Okay? So if you can actually improve things for everyone, for at least one person strictly and for the others at least not hurting them, then definitely you're not in a good situation. Okay? And the, the usual uh, requirement is that location is Pareto optimal, if there's no other feasible allocation which is better in this sense. 
So this is obviously the weakest requirement uh, of efficiency you can, you can look for. So if you're not efficient this way, you definitely do not make sense. Now, in this situation, the uh, Pareto efficiency basically says that, no, that you know, two bidders cannot basically exchange uh, some money for a good and both of them be happy with that. Okay, this is not true always in general, but this situation is true. So what does it mean? That if I have a value that's for a unit that's higher than your value, then it shouldn't be then, of course, what we could do, I could, and you got one unit even, even one unit, I would want to take that unit from you and pay you some kind of sum of money that's less than my, that what it's worth for me and more than what it's worth for you. Okay? So uh, the only reason why I could not do that is my budget was exhausted already. Okay? So that's basically the criteria when you can see that something is parallel efficient. Okay. So, so if it's Pareto, everything is allocated? Yes, in particular if it's Pareto, everything is allocated. Yeah, so Can, can't it be that, it's, that the prices are too high for everybody and just the only Pareto is not to buy anything? Like no, the, we set, get to set, to set the prices. You can actually right. give prices of zero. Okay. Part, yeah. okay. part, of the, part of the allocation is prices. There's no preset price. Yeah. Everyone yes. takes okay. a note of zero. We are now yeah. Yeah, and, and, and maybe I'm lying a little bit with values that are zero. If a unit is not worth nothing to anyone, then it's not exactly true. But. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So the first question is, I'm trying to tell you, what is the allocation that I'm trying to get? Very minimal requirement. The second question is, how am I taking into account the fact that we're talking about different people who have private values, who, and what do they do? So I'm going to design an auction, basically. So, I'm, so what's an auction? I'm going to design some kind of protocol that you know, each one of the participants has to tell me something, and then I allocate according to a certain rule. That specifies what I, as auctioneer, do. But what do, do the bidders do? Okay? So of course, I cannot, the whole point of this uh, auction theory kind of exercise is that you specify the rules, and then each one of the players participates the best in the way that they want. And the basic assumption in auction theory is that while they can do whatever they want, as opposed to what we do in computer science, we maybe assume that they're malicious or something like that, here we just assume that they are rational. They will do what's best for them. Okay, okay so what is best for them? That's, a very, that's not a psychological uh, statement, but rather a completely mathematical one. They will work in a way that optimizes their utility as stated. So that completely specifies what each one of them will do, but of course there's an interaction there. So there could be some kind of a game, and we should look at an equilibrium. But here's the strongest notion that's usually used, and that's, uh, we say that an auction is incentive compatible if all bidders always maximize their utility by simply reporting their private information to okay. So always means whatever the other bidders are doing. So they don't have to play this game with the other bidders because whatever the other bidders are doing or saying, they want to just tell us the truth. Okay. And this, this is the situation. So you manage to design an auction with rules that actually make it worthwhile to everyone, just tell you how much they value it, what is their V and what is their B, then you're happy. Then they will presumably just tell you your V and your B and you'll be able to calculate whatever you want to calculate. And now, so I don't want to, to, you know, to give a whole introduction to this whole idea of incentives, but one thing that I want to say that you can obviously think about other kind of mechanisms where people don't just tell you their input, but some react in some kind of this strategic way, which is not true, and then you analyze what happens when you take into account all the strategic interaction between all the different players, and then you look at the, the outcome and say, okay, I want that outcome to be good, let's say Pareto optimal. Okay? Now, the, what's called the revelation principle shows basically that you can simulate any kind of a, you know, complex protocol, indirect protocol like that, simply by a direct protocol where they just need to tell you their input and you do the calculation for them simply by simulation. You take into account, you simulate whatever their strategy is and you just do it for them. Okay? And, it, and it works. So this is really the idea that we're looking at incentive compatibility. This is really basically without loss of generality as long as we're taking into account what happens after strategic interaction of all the players. So our main theorem is the following, that you can't do it. <laughs> it's an impossible to result. 
So as long as you have more than a single unit, okay, so if you have one item and there's a value in the budget, you can sell it in an incentive-compatible way. You just take the minimum of the budget and the value, and that works. But as long as there are more than one, and more than one includes, you know, the infinity or whatever, then you cannot do it. You cannot do it as long as we're talking, you know, we're not uh, bypassing the, the budgets by actually, you know, paying people lots of money or anything like that, as long as it's what's called... Uh, you never pay more than what, it, what, what, what you got is worth for you, and you never get money. Okay, so these are standard uh, things which actually make sure that we're not cheating and ignoring the budget in some way. So as long as you're what's called individual rationality, that means you don't pay more than what you get, and no positive transfer, I don't pay to you money in order to, for you to get even more stuff, then you simply cannot do it. Now, uh, while there is a, that's a basic result showing that uh, the thing itself is hopeless, uh, we do have positive results. And basically, the positive results say that if the BI, the budgets, are public knowledge, so the whole impossibility thing is in the situation where each one has a private value V and a private budget B, uh, and we have to do, to do something that's incentive compatible for these two inputs, you know, secret inputs. Once the, pub, the, bu the budgets are public knowledge, then we do find uh, incentive-compatible mechanisms, and they're weird. So they're really strange, not like any other option that I've seen before. And, I mean, simple, but weird. And these are not bad in terms of revenue. They're, you know, the revenue is uh, the, right, uh, the right kind of thing. And actually, the way that uh, we actually prove the possibility result is because these weird auctions are unique. There's only a thing, these are the only auctions that are incentive compatible in Pareto Optimal, uh, for, at least for the case of two bidders. And once we know that they're unique, then basically uh, the, the impossibility for the general thing just follows because they're unique and what happens depends on the budget and for a different budget you must do different things and, and, and basically that uh, dies. So before I actually show you the general, try to derive it, uh, Here's a solution. Here's like a, one of the unique auctions that I was talking about. So here's a unique auction where you have two bidders. Alice has a budget of one, and Bob is not budget limited at all. Okay, so this is a situation when one of the players has a budget and the other player has no budget limit, simply infinity. So Alice has a budget of one, and Bob has an infinite budget. Coca-Cola versus the gold guy. Yes, for example, yes. Okay. So then there are, two, there are two situations. The first situation is, if the values are less than one, <clears throat> okay, I'm talking about the situation where the number of units is the continuum, okay? So it's infinite, and based on looking at it as one unit. So basically, if you get a quarter of the good, you play V over four. So we need, you need to somehow shift uh, those, the something times V is, should be comparable to V, but this something is now going to be less than one rather than a huge number. So it's a fraction. So if the value is less than 1, if the minimum of the value is less than 1, it means that really the budget doesn't come into play at all. Because, uh, you know, you have enough budget, even Alice has enough budget to buy everything, or at least according to the cheaper guy, and basically what you do is what's called the second price auction. You simply give everything to one player, to the player with higher value, and the amount that he pays is the standard classic second price. The interesting thing is what happens when the budget do come into account, and then there are two possibilities. One of them is that Alice has a higher V, and the other is that Bob has a higher V. So if Bob has a higher value than Alice, so not only does he have an infinite budget, but also his value is, la is larger, then Bob gets everything. So Alice that has low value and low budget gets nothing. But the really strange thing is how much do we want Bob to pay? And what he pays is one, is 1 plus the natural logarithm of the value of Alice. Okay? And this has to be it. On the other hand, if uh, Alice has the highest value, then what happens is as follows. So Alice basically gets to buy stuff at a rate, at a price per unit of value determined by Bob's value, VP. So basically, she pays everything, all that she's got, her budget, and the amount that she gets is the correct fraction as this fake price. Okay, so she pays 1 and gets a 1 over V of Bob fraction. And Bob gets the rest and pays for it the natural logarithm of his own value. Okay? So this is the result. 
And now I'll try to slowly derive and show you why this has to be the only thing that can be done. Um, we're in a situation where the value of Bob, um, no, the value of Bob is more than one, because, right? But it, it can pay less. I mean, it's possible that Bob is paying much less. I mean, specifically, because maybe he only gets just a tiny little amount, right? Can be more, can be less, right? Can be more, can be less, yes. Bob will be lower than Yeah. Okay, so uh, I want to start with uh, <coughs> what's called the market equilibrium, the classic economic way we would approach this kind of question, and then see what's wrong with it, and then just slightly change it. Yeah. Okay? So let's do a supply-demand kind of analysis. So what are people wanting? So suppose that we knew the price was P. How, much uni how many units would Alice want? How many units would Bob want? What would be the supply be? What would the demand be? How would we allocate it? Let's do this exercise, and, and then we'll, we'll fix. Okay? So let's see, what is the demand of better I at a certain price? Well, basically, he has a budget B, I. He has a budget B, I. The price per unit is P. So his demand would be B, I over B units. But this is, of course, as long as the price is more, less than its value, because if the price is more than its value, he doesn't want anything. Okay? This would be the demand of a certain bidder. So then we can get, basically, the demand of all the different bidders all the different, and compare that to the supply, which is M units. And you can do some kind of analysis, what would be the equilibrium, basically solve the equation of demand equals supply, where this is the form of the demand. And you can see that the price is basically, you take everyone, or we take the budget of every, everyone that's winning, in a second I'll say with everyone that's winning. You take the budget of everyone, and basically this amount of money has to basically be split into all the units that are being sold. And what you get is basically your proportion of the total budget. Now, this is true as long as these guys actually are willing to pay this amount of money at this price. Okay? So the sum is not over all the possible failures, but only with those that have a value that's high enough. And high enough, of course, now the problem is that P also determines what are you summing over, so you just need to basically find the right P that if you look at the Vs, which actually sum only over them, you still get the right quality. Okay. So the nice way to actually think about this, uh, and by the way, uh, like any market, equilibrium is Pareto efficient. Okay. So it's the way to look at it, because it's not completely clear how you do this, find it, it's how you do this calculation of finding the P, which also depends on the set of Vs that are larger than the P itself, is the way you can look at it, it actually is an ascending auction. If you take the price and you slowly increase it, and each point you actually say, you ask the people, everyone, how, much, how many units do you want? And if they want too many units, you keep on increasing the price until at some point you get into equality. Okay? And that would work, and I actually want to, uh, to give an example. Suppose we have, I'm um, like running a market here. Suppose we have just two bidders and 200 items. Suppose that their values are large. Okay, so I don't want to actually put it to a example. And one guy has, a, Alice has $500 budget, Bob has $1,500 budget. So we start with price of one, at which point Alice says, okay, I want everything, because it's only cost me $200, which is less than my budget. Bob wants, wants everything. Total demand is 400. Supply is 200. The price needs to go up. So with two, still everyone wants everything. At three, uh, things change a bit, because at price of $3 per unit, Alice does not want to everything, because she can't pay for it, but she wants 500 over three, and of course, you we're talking about integer units, so you really want 166 rather than 166.6. Okay. But still, the total demand is more than what we have available, so the price needs to go up. At 4, Alice only wants 125. At 5, only 100. Uh, uh, I'm jumping, let's say at 8. Well, Alice wants 500 over 8, and Bob wants 1500 over 8, and we're still, we still, the price is still too low. At 9, the price is still too low. Luckily enough, at 10, uh, actually, Alice only wants 50 units, Bob only wants 150 units. Together, bingo, this is exactly the same. Actually, this would happen just slightly before 10, at something like 9.9, .9, Still, Alice would only want 50, because 51 would be too much, and Bob would want 150. So really, the equilibrium would be something like 9.99. No, not the equilibrium, but this auction would give you something like 9.99. Okay. 
Okay. So at this point, this is the allocation that we get. She gets 50 units. She pays $500, slightly less than that, really, 50 times 99.9, and, and so on. And that's the auction. Okay. So now uh, the question is, is this incentive... Okay, so this is... The outcome is Pareto optimal. There's no better way, really, better way to allocate stuff. But is this incentive compatible? Is there something better that they can do? Okay. So a few things about this kind of... Uh, Kind of thing. First of all, the ascending auction does reach an equilibrium price when it stops. Uh, you, need, you need to be careful. At a certain point, bidders may drop completely out, and then at the exact point that they drop, they may, it may change between too little to too much, and, but any point in the middle is good, if you wish, and, and that, that would be an equilibrium. And it's always correct optimal. But the point is, this is not incentive compatible. So the way you as a participant could improve, improve your luck, get a better utility, is what's called the classic thing of demand reduction. If you are willing to take less items, then of course you will not be as happy at getting more items, but that could decrease the price significantly so you'd get a total gain. Okay? So for example, suppose that so far I didn't talk at all about what is the valuation of the players, but suppose that Bob's valuation is 11. So you can see it makes really little money, really little gain from it, because the price now is 10. But he is in his power, is completely, completely within his power to make sure that the auction stops at the price of 5, for example. For example, if he says, no, I'm not willing to pay more than 5, then at that point, at 5, Alice will only be able to buy 100 units, because that's her budget allows, and he will get the other 100 units at the price of 5, so obviously this is much better than really just playing normally. So if you are willing to be slightly less greedy, you'll get a better deal. This is very well known. Now, uh, but still, this does have some uh, nice properties. So basically, if the, either the budgets don't come into play, or the values don't come into play, that is, the values are either very low or very high compared to the budgets, then this is incentive compatible. So really, the only way you could gain is by this kind of budget, uh, by, by demand reduction. But can we get something that works uh, completely? So, uh, so what is the wrong? What is wrong with this kind of auction? What makes the non-incentive compatibility? So basically, what happened is that. <coughs> oh, okay. I mean, then it's a little bit difficult. Thing. But I think part of the idea of this whole auction game is that I shouldn't be paying as much as you know to the point that it got, but I should be paying basically the harm that I caused to others. Okay. So the amount that I should be paying is the minimum that was needed to buy, and usually the minimum that is needed to buy is what would be the other, you know, what would be the other option? What am I making? What am I causing others not to get? And this should be the kind of logic behind it. And indeed, Asabo actually actually uh, suggested an auction uh, for the multi-unit case without budgets uh, that. Uh, it's just slightly different from this ascending auction, and actually exactly tries to capture this idea. And Asabo suggested the, the following idea. So indeed, as before, you increase the price as long as the demand is the, as long as the demand is more than the supply. Now, as you increase the price, the players will demand less and less units, will want less and less, because, for example, for whatever reason. And what I look at as a bidder, when can I be sure that I'll get the unit? So when can I be sure that I get the unit? Well, if all the other bidders together want at most M minus X units at this price, then it's sure certainly that I get at least X units in this auction. The price will only go higher, maybe I'll, okay, but at least X units I will be willing to get at this price. And the idea is that what I should be paying for a unit is the lowest price at which, which I, what's called, clinched it. So I clinched the unit if everyone else does not want anymore. So I keep on rising, and as, as the prices go up, bidder, other bidders want less and less items. I keep clinching units, and each time I clinch a unit, that determines the price for this unit. So I get the first unit for a low price, the second unit for a slightly higher price, and so on, until I say, no, I don't want any more units. That's what Osobo uh, suggested. And uh, in the usual uh, model of, of auctions, he actually showed that this is actually what's called the VCG crisis. So this is incentive compatible, it's just a different way to actually view the usual what's called VCG prices, which are incentive compatible in terms of an ascending auction. 
so what we actually observe is that actually this also works very well in, in once you have budgets. Now there's a delicate thing that you have to know. In terms of the, you know, in the usual way, if you don't have budgets, when I say what is the other, what is the demand of the other guy, that's completely determined to begin with. It's not, you can actually write a formula that's saying what would be the demand of all of the other guys at price 7. Because, you know, you know they have their budget divided by 7, very simple, maximum with a value, very simple. In our situation, their demand actually depends on how much money they, 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 they spent so far for the item that they clinched already. So there's some kind of algorithmic kind of thing going on here, where you clinch, a, you clinch a bunch of units which actually determines the price that you pay for them, and that determines the price that you already pay, determines the budgets that you, that your demand ongoing. But still, at least if we look at it algorithmically, we just say, okay, you just run the algorithm, you keep on having this. So if I clinch units, I look at my remaining budget, so my original budget minus the sum of all the prices of the units that I've clinched, divided by the current price, because I know that the new units that I get are going to be at price P. Okay, so that's basically the algorithm, the options that we have. You basically run this ascending price, but you keep on track when did I actually win a unit and how much did I pay. And, and the only thing that I'm really uh, cheating here is how to exactly handle ties, where you know two guys drop together, one of them because budget, one of them because value, but that's the you know. So let me run uh, an example. So suppose I have three items for sale and two bidders. Alice has a budget of 12, Bob has a budget of 14, and again, let's assume that the values are high. So let's see what happens. Uh, <clears throat> at price of 1, Alice still has everything remaining, she hasn't clipped anything, so she wants 3 units. Bob still has its 14 available, and he also wants 3 units at price of 1. At price of 2, the same thing. Still Alice can pay for all 3 units, same can Bob, same thing at 3, same thing at 4. Now, when do things change? Well, when we go slightly above 4 to 4 plus epsilon, okay, at this point, Alice cannot, does not want all three items. Okay? So at 4 plus epsilon, she, Alice does not want, so she, her demand goes down to 2. Well, Bob still wants all the three because his budget is 14. At this point, Bob clinches an item at the price of 4. Okay? So once he clinches an item at the price of 4, his remaining budget goes down to 10, because he already paid 4, and his remaining budget hasn't changed, and they keep on going. Okay? So again at 5, uh, still Bob wants both items, but now, when we go up to 5 plus epsilon, now we will only want one more item. Okay? At that point, Alice clinches this item for a price of 5, and we keep on going. So at 6 now, uh, what's it, what's it, what's it, what's it, what's it, and Bob has $10 remaining, Alice has $7 remaining, the price is 6, both of them want it, both of them have clinched one item, Bob for price of 5, Alice for the price of 4. Okay, so at 7, plus epsilon, Alice does not want an item at all, so Bob gets a second item for a price of 7. So the total outcome is that Alice gets one item for $5, Bob gets both items for $11, and the theorem is that this is it. Okay, so what can we say about this uh, adaptive clinching option? So the first point is, is it incentive compatible? Should I always just do uh, the, you know, just play, uh, do, do the right thing, just play, just report my current value and my correct value and budget and let the algorithm run correctly. Okay. And uh, the answer is no. Why not? How can you gain? So the only way you can gain is basically by, so the way you gain is indirectly. If you exhaust your opponent's budget faster, then you're, you will clinch units later, e earlier, and pay less for them. So the way to gain is to report basically higher budgets than you have. By this, we keep on reporting higher demands, waiting, making your opponent win items later and pay for them more, and hence exhaust their budget. So, so actually this is something that you can do and it's very easy to show that. 
However, what can be shown is that if you can't play with your budget, if the budget are completely known, so in particular, the budget is completely known means that the demand at each point is completely known, okay? <clears throat> you, the only question you have is whether you drop out because the budget of the auction because you've reached your value and then your demand goes to zero. And if you haven't dropped out, the demand is completely known. Then it is incentive compatible. And the reason is pretty simple, actually. Well, the only thing you can basically do is decide whether to drop out of the auction or not. Any item that you win after a certain price, you will only pay for it more than this price, so there's no reason whatsoever to remain in the budget when it reached your value. And there's no reason to drop too early because you can always drop later and keep on getting an item before you drop. So this is actually quite easy to see why this is incentive compatible. And also it's not difficult to show that it's a <coughs> incentive compatible, that it's a Pareto optimal. Basically, once you drop, you cannot, it's exactly the point that you can't get anything from anyone else either. What's more complicated is showing that this is unique, but again, this is actually, the proof here is somewhat unusual in the field. Uh, basically, you show that the price for the first item, the first item that it's auction sale, it has to be. You can't sell for less than that, and then you can simply run induction, but that's a delicate part. Okay, let me, since I don't have time, let me skip the revenue, which is good. Um, and let's go back to the example that I showed you, and let's see why, how it basically uh, is implied by the previous auction when I run it like in a continuous dynamic process rather than, you know, this good thing. Okay? So if you remember, this was the auction that I showed you that, you know, Alice has a budget of one, Bob doesn't have a budget limit. And we said that if the values are low, you do a second price. And afterward, basically the interesting thing is what you pay the logarithm of the, of the of Alice. And here is the logic. Let's see what happens when we run our auction, or also of auction, in this setting. Uh, as the price in increases from 0 to 1, assuming that the values are high enough, that are above 1, basically, I still want Alice, I want everything, and Bob wants everything. Because uh, okay, the value is more than 1, and uh, their budget is, even Alice's budget is 1, so she can buy everything. So the, nothing is clinched until the price reaches 1. Now, when the price increases from V to the minimum, to the lowest price of V Alice and V Bob, that is at this point, still both of them want it. Bob wants everything because he has no budget limit. Alice can only pay for 1 over P. Okay? okay? So how much bid does bidder B, how much can he have clinched until price P? Well, basically at P, Alice only wants 1 over, one over P, so bidder up, up to P, uh, Bob clinched 1 minus 1 over P units. How much does he pay for it? Well, we said that what he clinched at a certain price, uh, you know, a certain price P, he has to pay the basically P for that sub, for that little unit. So to compute what he paid, we basically need to, to, to integrate the amount that he clinched at price P, which is the derivative of this function C. This is uh, the, the amount that he clinched at price P, times the price P that he paid for that amount, and you simply integrate that from uh, zero, from one to P. And if you integrate it, that is now P, and that's what you get. And then, at that point, you actually allocate the, the bunch to Bob, this price, and then at that point, either Bob or Alice goes away, and the other guy gets everything for the price you make. So this is why, this is what you have to do. Okay, so I think I'll uh, stop here and just say that in general I think that uh, budgets can be dealt with in auction theory. It's a bit uh, cumbersome. Not always uh, the most natural or more useful practically options. But I still think, still think that you know, there are things to be done there. And two, two specific questions there. One of them we always uh, wanted exact incentive compatibility and show that you can't do something if you, unless a budget or public knowledge. So, of course, we can, uh, you know, we can weaken the requirement to some kind of approximation or weaken ocean of incentive compatibility uh, and until we get something positive. And the other question, of course, we use budget and simply multi-unit auctions. Basically, auctions where all items just are the same, identical. Of course, we can talk about combinatorial auctions where the different units are different, which is a very uh, large area. But take budget into account, and it's more complicated, of course, than this. So, uh, thank you.